Welcome to SME TV News and Views. I'm your host, Angela Vithoukas. Today's Let's Talk panel looks at the government stimulus being offered to our SMEs and how they can, they're trying to help them get through this battle of the COVID-19. SMEs have been hearing everything from compulsory shutdowns to hibernating for six months and, of course, my favourite, stay home. It's been a confusing, anxious and stressful time for all with more questions than answers. Joining me today to break it all down is our regular panellist, Craig West, Director of Succession Plus. Hi, Craig. Hi, Ange. Thanks for having me. Welcome back. And a new guest, Mark Pinhorn, Director and Partner of HYD Advisory. Hi, Mark. Hi, Ange. Now, we're going to start with Craig because we normally do, Mark. It's um, not first in best dressed, but that's just how it rolls. I like to say it's uh, alphabetical, but... WS that won't apply here. Craig, what's the market saying to you? What are you hearing with your clients or your stakeholders? Has the government set a good foundation to build the financial bridge that we need over a virus that can't be cured today? I actually think the government's done a pretty good job. I think very difficult circumstances, constantly changing. You know, the news comes out literally every 10 minutes as an update on some of the news sites about what's happening and new rates and new issues. I think the government's done a fairly good job of trying to manage that from an economic point of view. Um, I'm not a health expert. I'm assuming they've got that in hand with the relevant people. But I think from a business and economic point of view, they've thrown a lot of money at the economy. Um, both at individuals who may well be out of work as casuals in, you know, in retail or whatever the business might be, but also in businesses where the government has used words like hibernation. They're obviously keen to make sure that business survives and is able to recover quickly when we get to the other side of this, whenever that might be. And I think they've done a pretty good job in making it happen. That's the fantasy plan, right? Let's chuck money at it. Um, it's been yep. done before in different instances and around the world when countries' economies are facing a tough moment ahead. So we know that chuck money at it, money at it doesn't always work. Uh, we need yep. to have a plan. We, we are trying to talk about recovery at the same time. But, Mark, I'm, I'm going to bring you in here. You've had more, more than two decades' experience in the financial world with your clients and advising them. Um, we've talked briefly before. You're overall happy with the stimulus package that's put forward. In fact, you've given out, I know, a, a top 10 of the government initiatives, and we're going to focus a couple on, on those today. But are you happy with the, the, the money that's being chucked at the economy? Andrew, I think it's a very well-targeted package, targeted at business and making it very clear that the government is interested in helping business survive this very tough period and keep people employed. Which is obviously where we've got to go, Craig. I mean, if people don't have a job, then they're going to be dependent on us for a lot longer than just this, this short term that we've got to live through. So we need to keep people employed. But, Craig, what about people that, that can't? You know, we, we're going to, some businesses will run out of options. Yeah, and look, I think there's a, there's a really a two-speed economy starting to happen already. I, in my own client base, I've got a client in Perth that manufactures fresh pasta. He has never been busier. He cannot get enough staff. He's trying to hire trucks to do deliveries. Like, he's really under the pump to deliver. I've got another client in Melbourne who does major events, including things like the recently cancelled Australian Grand Prix. He's dead. He has got no work at all. Every single booking that he had between March, when it first started, and October has been cancelled already. He's got no income for the next six months. So you've got he will get some of the government stimulus and that'll work for him. How well, I'm not sure because he's got a very big operation. You know, he's got hundreds of casual staff that he normally has employed, particularly at this time of year. Um, he's got a large warehouse factory. He owns a massive inventory of equipment that he hires out. And so those challenges are quite difficult. Now, the government, you know, yes, they're throwing money at this problem. And what I really liked was they're throwing money on the basis of employees. So businesses with employees are going to get more money, which I think is a good thing. What I'm not sure they can do is recover that. Yeah, because they want those jobs to still be there further down Absolutely. the road. Absolutely. And they should. And that's a good thing. Yeah. So, Mark, um, I know that with your clients, you, you advise them as well and you, you help them navigate this complicated financial world that we get ourselves into as business owners. That's the good times. We're faced now with very unusual circumstances that we've never experienced before. Hard to give advice on a situation that we don't know, A, how long it will last and B, what exactly it's going to look like. 
But I know you've got two favourites at the moment or the, the top two things that the government's offering as a stimulus. Let's look at both of those now and then I'm, I'm sure Craig and Ola have much more questions going from there. Yeah, thanks, Anne. So, look, there's two major initiatives in the government stimulus package that applies to SMEs. The first one is the Job Keeper package. Yep. Um, so whilst the detail is a little light at the moment, um, we expect to get some clarity around that Wednesday night. But in summary, that's a wages subsidy that the government is offering employers to keep people employed, keep people on the books. So the way that it works basically is that the government will provide employers with a subsidy of $1,500 per employee per fortnight under the job keeper package yep. on the basis that the employer meets a key test, which is that their turnover has dropped or is expected to drop by 30% or more. So has dropped or expected to drop, right? Because if, if you're a business with a pipeline and that's how you normally work, and that's been cancelled, you know you're going to drop, but you can't demonstrate that immediately. That's correct. So mm. as I said at the moment, the detail is a little light, but our understanding is um, that is the case, either has dropped or expected to drop. So for example, an employer that has been hit uh, very hard by the shutdown and their turnover for the month of April, if that is expected to be less than, uh, to drop by more than 30%, uh, with a comparable month last year, say April last year, then they initially meet that test. So what that does is provides them with a lifeline of cash flow coming in to allow them to continue paying their employees and keep that connection with their employees so that when this passes, that business has got its employees on the books and can get up and running again as soon as possible. Okay, that's number one. Number two? The second is the cash flow boost, and that's designed to provide employers with a credit of 100% of the amount of PAYG withholding that they withhold from staff wages and provide that to the employer in the form of either a cash refund if they don't owe the ATO any other money from GST or other taxes, or if they do owe the ATO money and have a tax account with them, they'll receive a credit to offset the amount owing. Okay. So it's a very positive strategy to uh, encourage, again, employers to keep people employed. Right. Well, let's let's look at the first one, the JobKeeper package. Obviously, it's a great initiative. Um, people who have lost their job and aren't with an employer anymore have access to their own allowance. But this one is for people who are in work to help the employer subsidise some of that cost. What about, Mark, the issues that are out there right now with people saying it's not enough, that that particular job keeper allowance is not enough? Yeah, and it, and it probably never would be enough in any uh, any event. The discussions that I've had with clients at the moment is that uh, some of them are looking at cutting down the amount of hours that they pay their staff or putting them on a reduced pay, but they're very keen to keep that labour force intact and support those long-term employees. So. Uh, whether it's enough or not enough uh, is very debatable, but it's a step in the right direction and it's a subsidy to help the employer and help the employees. Craig, uh, right now there are a lot of people out there saying that in order for this to be fair and equitable, we have to all share in the pain. Uh, it's obvious because you've got big businesses putting off 8,000, 9,000, 10,000 staff mm -hmm. and, and they do that what appears to be in the matter of minutes, those announcements are made. SMEs tend to try and hang on for dear life. Sometimes, though, that gets us into a little bit of trouble because if we really don't have the financial backup to come through what could be a six-month hibernation intensely, no amount of, of job keeper money is going to save you at the other end. So there is that subsidy available. You know, some would say that $750 a week most of their employees are being paid double, if not more than that. So there's going to be that gap. But if you've got revenue coming in, that's okay. What if you don't though, Craig? What if you've lost all your, all your business? There's no revenue coming in. You want to try and hang on to staff. What kind of financial world are you going to live in then in six months' time? Yeah, I think that's a really difficult one for anyone, including the government, to solve because there are going to be businesses that have literally no income for three, four, five, six months. And 
you know, yes, the job keeper may well allow them to pay employees something, which is certainly better than nothing. Yes. But there are some people, you know, if you've got two kids going to school and a family and a house and a mortgage and all those things, $750 a week is probably not going to quite cut it. So you need to think about that. But from a business owner's point of view, there's also the issue of, you know, there's, there's a rent. So the government's made announcements now that if your turnover's dropped, your rent's going to drop accordingly and in proportion, which is which is a good thing. But you've still got a lot of other costs. You know, as a small business owner, there's still other fixed costs. You know, there's, there's equipment. You might have a truck or a vehicle that you deliver goods in. You might have equipment that you're paying leases on. Well, you know, there's financial... all sorts of other costs that come in. Yeah, your financial structure wasn't geared for COVID-19. You... Well, I don't think many people were. Um, well, I don't think anybody the, saw this coming. The issue, though, is that are we prepared... Are we resilient enough? Have we allowed for the worst case scenario, which, you know, a couple of months ago we didn't know it existed, now we do. And moving forward, Mark, do you think your clients are going to be looking at their financial structure a lot differently? Will you be advising them differently now on on how to somehow protect themselves of the next bad news that we face? Because it will happen again. Something like this on this scale will probably, that's what our experts are telling us, This something like this could in fact happen again. I think it emphasises the importance of business owners planning ahead. As Craig said, nobody could ever have anticipated uh, what's happened happening. But a lot of business owners have got by for many years in a relatively good business environment. Now that environment's changed very quickly and become a lot tougher. Some of those businesses probably were never going to uh, survive in a very tough environment. So more so than ever now, the importance of cash flow planning, knowing how much money's coming in over the next six months and scenario planning and looking at your costs and outgoings to, to see whether the sums work because, quite frankly, it's not going to work for some businesses and they're better off knowing sooner than later and making appropriate decisions and getting appropriate advice early. That's, that's right because there's no point getting into deeper debt unless you have a, a good idea that you can battle that later on. Uh, Mark, I think one of the dangers that we're facing, um, and, and Craig, I'm, I'm sure you'll agree here too, is that we're hearing from different entities like banks on deferring things. One of those issues that business owners are going to face is they think that deferring means not paying and it's not. It just means we're we're putting off the inevitable of what's going to come later. And if you haven't got it today, what makes us think we're going to have it in six months' time? So that deference that's being offered, that's a little bit of a slippery slope for some of us SMEs. Yeah, look, I understand the reasoning behind that very, very well, And um, Some businesses need a lifeline for six months yes. and may have a very good business model and they have very good prospects coming out the other end. For those businesses putting payments on hold for mortgages and uh, equipment financing and so on, it's a very viable option in some cases, whereas for other businesses, uh, they're just delaying the inevitable and they won't be able to pay that. So, Craig, some people need to be a little bit realistic and sit down and say exactly for for something that they haven't done for a long time, probably is sit down and look at their business, what it was a year ago, where it might be moving forward and make some tough decisions. And that might be including whether they keep staff or not moving forward. It could be a big mistake for them to just keep staff on just to get the job keeper. Oh, absolutely. I think the big thing is, Ange, and we're we're particularly bad at this in Australia. We have a very DIY attitude to business. Um, I actually wrote an article the other day and sort of said, you know, you would never think about doing your own root canal therapy, but Business owners, all the, I talk to business owners all the time who manage their own bookkeeping and accounting. They, I had one guy who downloaded a sale of business legal contract from the internet and tried to use that for a $2 million transaction. You to know, save them, it's just save cultural. A little bit of money. Yeah, they need to. I think if you're in business today and you're not 100% sure and if you're not an accountant and you're not a lawyer or a business advisor, you're in business because you're really good at doing air conditioning or being a hairdresser or laying bricks or whatever it is, then you need to get good advice. And it's going to cost you a little bit of money, but if you get the right advice, it should save you or make you a lot more than what it costs. So I think now's a really good time to get good advice. So, Mark, this is um, an ideal time now then for a lot of your clients to look at how they might restructure, 
uh, if any, how they might plan further down the track. And I guess in a way, if you have to look at the silver lining, how they might place themselves around tax structure moving forward, because we're clearly going to incur losses. I mean, there's that one, a couple of percent of businesses who are, as you said, Craig, you've got a client master who's doing enormous trade and work now. And most people are being impacted. So it's an ideal time, Mark, for us to be absolutely honest, really put the spotlight on our financial circumstances, our business and plan for the future. But um, a couple of the other things that you've mentioned in your top 10 list is, you know, the ATO payment deferrals. There's no need to squeeze your cash flow too much. That's You can always have a conversation with the ATO now more than ever, right? Yeah, absolutely. So we've contacted the ATO on behalf of quite a lot of our clients to request extensions. Um, so the ATO are very open to that at the moment. That's their policy. But absolutely, speak to your accountant about how to best spend your available funds. We've put in place uh, payment arrangements, payment deferrals with the ATO for, for an, quite a number of clients. We're deferring payment of taxes as long as possible. Yep. We're claiming credits for some uh, PAYG instalments that have already been paid in previous quarters this year. Right, so there's right. a range, range of opportunities there. So you, you I mean, you, you've got 10, but on, 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 and I'm just going to run backwards very quickly now. Um, instant asset write-off and accelerated depreciation, that, that you're, you're flagging that. The early release of super, for some people, that, that might be a good option. Um, the government-backed SME loans, this is something... I think that we need to look a little bit closer at because this might be an ideal time for some businesses to actually expand. Um, if they're thinking ahead, why not? And a, a big one I think that hasn't had a lot of attention here, Craig, is the apprentices and trainees, those wage subsidies. I mean, this is, again, an ideal time to take a strong look at what your industry looks like moving forward because we've been hearing for years how much of an apprentice shortage there is. You know, there's there's the ability now for some SMEs to actually pay their apprentices more. I've actually got a young uh, female trainee in my office, absolutely brilliant young girl, school leaver from last year. She finished HSC last year. She's now doing law at university. She's brilliant. Um, she is a trainee in our office. She's very inexperienced. She's been out of school literally four or five months. Yep. But if that plan helps someone like me or other businesses, A, keep her on and continue to encourage her to go to uni and continue studying and work with us as a bit of experience on the side. I think that's a good thing. Um, there's always been, and there has been for a long time, certainly in New South Wales and around Australia, a shortage of good quality tradesmen. Yep. The more we can do to encourage that, the better. The, the better chance we'll have of getting our all sorts of repairs done to the standards that we've expected. And the last thing Absolutely. you want is to be bidding war with a, a plumber or an electrician, Mark. But um, two things I want to cover off because we need to wrap up. The New South Wales payroll, ta payroll tax waiver, I think that's, you know, I've, I've always been a big advocate for getting rid of payroll tax, but I think that's really important for those larger enterprises who um, are investing in their workforce and for some reason paying double tax. We've it's all a mystery to me, that one, as to why, but that's a really good one. The last thing I want to discuss with you, though, Mark, is the New South Wales government, the $10,000 grants for mm -hmm. businesses severely impact. What, what's that structure? Yeah, so that's designed to support businesses that have been affected by uh, the health order to shut down. Yep. Um, so it would apply to businesses like gyms, cafes, um, businesses uh, in hospitals. Clubs, clubs. Yeah, but, but um, not the ones yeah. Yeah. No, it's, and it's only, uh, it seems that it's designed to apply to quite small businesses that are under the payroll tax threshold for wages. So wages of less than $900,000 a year. And the prerequisite is that their turnover must have dropped by 75% uh, or more. So in other words, they've been forced to pretty much shut down their business. And uh, there's a $10,000 grant available for qualifying businesses. And that's a, that's a one-off and that's from the New South Wales government because there's some confusion, I think, with what the federal government's offering and what the state government's offering. Mm. Um, and that's definitely the payroll tax. The last two that we mentioned, the payroll tax waiver and the $10,000 grant, that's a New South Wales government initiative. Uh, I, you know, and, and this is a federal issue when it comes to anything to do with money in and money out of a business because it all revolves around the ATO and any of those obligations mm. that we're I would love to mention two more things, Ange, just quickly. I've been contacted through my business in the last couple of days by both Facebook and Google. Both have very, very generous grants programs for businesses that are advertising or have advertised with them for some time. Google, it goes right back to 2019. So if you've been advertising using Google AdWords, which I have, 
since January 2019. They've got quite a generous grant. You have to use it on Google Ad Credits, obviously, but it's quite generous. And Facebook's just announced they're doing the same thing. So I think we're starting to see a little bit of corporate contribution as well towards small business, which are a large part of their client base, to hopefully prop them up in a similar way to what the government's doing. Well, the grant means that there's probably going to be some money put in by the SMEs and some sure. provided. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And, and, but, Mark, it's not a deferral and it's not putting it off. It's it's a complete waiver of some things or a matching. Nothing you have to pay back. I always like those numbers on the balance sheet. No, nope. don't have to pay that back. Thanks very much for joining us. We look forward to chatting with you soon. That's another episode of Let's Talk for SME TV News and Views. Don't forget to join us again. There's a lot more on the website to have a look at, smea.org.au, for more episodes and podcasts. We'll catch you next time. Thank you. Cool.